We're going to start tonight. The purpose tonight, the purpose is we're going to start to peel away some of the assumptions about Scripture that you may not know you have yet. And I realize as I start this process that all the handouts that I made for tonight are sitting in my office. So you'll get those some other time. It's fine. Well, we're going to start to peel back some of the assumptions that you have about the Bible when you open it up to read it and start to talk about translations of the Bible. So to do that, and I understand that this is not ideal for at least two of our people here, but to the extent you're able to participate, please do. So if you are able to be mobile, to stand up and move around the room, please stand up and kind of gather down the center of the room. No, no, don't worry about moving the chairs. You just, the middle is open. So, so no, you don't need to form a lot. That, folks, you're getting way too technical. Yeah, be a mob in the middle of the room. You want me to get your hand out? I got underwear uh, on my chair. Is it on the handouts? No. Uh, that's, the, that's the key. You know the key to get into the building? Either, yeah. Number four. Okay, that's and that's the green one is my office. Okay, they just on your desk. When you go to my desk, they're on the right corner. There's two. Your chair. Looking at your chair. No, no if you walk in, they're on the right hand corner. Um, I would just enjoy yourself. This way you don't need to reveal either. Okay, here we go. Now you are going to move to one side of the room or the other. And there are a lot of you, I mean, there's a lot more room up here, too. So you're all kind of, you're pretending like it's Sunday morning. you got to get as far to the back <laughs> as you can. But feel free to, to, to move up here if you want. I am going to make a statement. And you, think of, think of this as a spectrum. Over on this wall is strongly agree. So if I make the statement and you strongly agree with it, Stand at that wall if you agree with it, you know, in here somewhere. If you're right in the middle, stay in the middle. If you strongly disagree, you're on this wall. Got it? Yeah, nice. Pretty self-explanatory. So let's have some fun. Here we go. God dictated the words of Scripture to the original authors who recorded them without addition or omission. God dictated the words of Scripture to the original authors who recorded them Strongly agree, strongly disagree. But uh, no, middle, middle ground right here is I don't know or I don't have an opinion. So to the extent you're on the wall, you strongly disagree or strongly agree. Okay, so here we go. That God dict if you strongly agree with that, you're on that wall. Is it the inspired word of God? No. That's not what I said. <laughs> See, assumptions. Good assumptions. Dictated. Okay, look around. So if you're strongly against that wall, you believe that God dictated the words of Scripture to the original authors. Over here, you strongly don't agree with it over here. Ready? Number two. My mom would say, put your listening ears on. <laughs> Number two, God inspired the authors of Scripture in such a way as to ensure their writing, shaped by the author's individuality, nevertheless accurately recording God's word. God inspired the authors of Scripture in such a way as to ensure their writing, Accurately recorded God's word, but it was shaped by the author's individuality. Strongly agree, strongly disagree, no opinion. Okay, good. You might just camp out in the middle, I don't know. Somebody <laughs> Okay, so we have, uh, in general, the group is strongly agreeing with that statement. We'll get to that later. Number three, God used the authors of Scripture in their own particular historical and cultural context 
to communicate God's word for that time and place. <coughs> Can you read that again? Yes, yeah, strongly agree, strongly disagree, somewhere in the middle. God used the authors of scripture in their own historical and cultural context to communicate God's word for that time and place. Is there somebody strongly agreeing with that who'd be bold enough to say why you strongly agree with that? What statement in that would you... So it's relevant to that time and place. Marilyn, you say, but what about us? It's for us too. What about that? So It may be great in the historical perspective, but it still applies to today. But is it relevant to the historical perspective? Yeah, yeah, that yes. history yeah, that's true. Yeah. Then why are you strongly disagreeing? Because <laughs> I think it's relevant to them. They don't too much. It appears to be just to them. Yeah. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Don't get angry with me. <laughs> Number four, God has protected the translations of Scripture through the ages so that what we have in our modern Bibles is the same as God's original words. Disagree over here. Oh, okay. So we're strongly. This group has strongly disagreed that the words in the Bibles that you have are God's original words. That's very interesting. All right, number five. The Bible is inerrant, completely without error of any kind. The Bible is inerrant, completely without error of any kind. Strongly disagree, strongly agree. The Bible. The Bible. <laughs> the best part about watching this is watching the looks of confusion on your face. <laughs> as you wonder if you've contradicted yourself already. Yeah. Could you read that one more time? The Bible is inerrant, completely without error of any kind. And Kirk's staying put after hearing it again. All right. Number six, the Bible may contain errors and inconsistencies, but only in trivial matters. <laughs> the Bible may contain errors and inconsistencies, but only in trivial matters. I don't be a libertarian. All right. We're starting to diversify here as we move through. Yeah. And I've done this before, and it usually does happen that the middle starts to get somewhat clogged by the end of this thing because everybody just gets confused. All right. The Bible is a human document. As such, it is limited and subject to errors of both fact and history. The Bible is a human document. It is limited and subject to errors of both fact and history. Strongly agree, strongly disagree. Which is agree? Over here. Where is it disagree? Um, that wall over there. It's that strongly disagree. But if you kind of just disagree a little bit. Read that again, John. The Bible is a human document. As such, it is limited and subject to errors of both fact and history. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Finally, the Bible contains everything there is to know about God. Right, this is a strongly disagreement. Here we go again. <laughs> Finally, the entire group almost <laughs> agrees on something. All right, have a seat. Right where we are. <laughs> yeah. Some of you, by the end of this, might just sit down on the strongly disagree wall and say, I quit. <laughs> I quit. No. My whiteboard's got. Yeah, I'm about to have this one. This is a lovely whiteboard. And 
I am a whiteboard fanatic. I love it. So I don't, I don't, I don't teach without a whiteboard and a cup of coffee. So that is what, that's what we need. That's what we need. All right. Tonight we're talking about. We got God here. First Presbyterian Church of Albany. All of you. How do? How does God's word get from God to First Presbyterian Church of Albany? You didn't bring it with you? That's what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. You're looking at it. The fax machine in your office. Take a look at it. Take one of these, pass it around. I don't. You are going to be sorely disappointed. You know what I don't have is an eraser. That's going to make it difficult on me. Scooter. I'll just, <laughs> Scooter, take your shirt off. We'll, we'll just use that. Well, thank you. All right. Does she move her nose right back? No. Here you All right. Okay. What you're getting is a sheet that has words that are frequently associated with the Bible. I would say frequently associated, frequently mm, ill-defined. Not, we don't really, these are words that, that either individuals or traditions throw around, but we rarely ever think about what it actually means. And I think that's to our great detriment. And sometimes, I mean, I've heard preachers just string these all together. And I have thought to myself, you know, I wonder, you know, when they get on a roll, have you ever heard that where the pastor gets rolling and he said, this is, this is the Bible. This is the inerrant, infallible, inspired, in whatever word of God. And I think, but what does he mean by that? So let's talk about him. I left you a little bit of space. If you brought a pen and you want to write notes underneath, we're going to leave authoritative just there for a second. But... Let's start at the bottom with inspired. So when we did this, when I asked you the question about inspired, is the, is, the, is the Bible inspired, the inspired word of God? Most of you agreed with that to one degree or another. But what do you mean when you say the Bible is inspired? Because there was diversity with God dictated. And different traditions believe different things about this. So... How did the word get from God to human beings? There's different levels of inspiration. What are different things you've heard about what it means that the Bible is inspired? You don't have to believe this. Nobody's gauging your belief system right now. But what have you heard from different preachers, different whatever teachers? What does it mean that the Bible is inspired? It means you sit down and write short and just read what God told you. Yeah, so that would be the, the dictation. Yeah. So, somebody came to Jesus. God dictated the words is one, one thing. Another possibility is that they came in visions. So, uh, what would that have looked like? Uh, what, what would that look like if, um, what, what do you mean by it came in a vision? A, a, a dream or a. Yeah, so, a dream. so, somebody has a dream and they write it down. Yeah. Are they writing down exactly what they, is it, how close is that to dictation? It's very yeah, different. Very different. I would, I think, I so that leaves how you interpret the vision. Yeah. It's vision from yeah. So some interpretation required. Yes, yeah, so it might be the 99.747 that he saw. But we don't know. Okay. So some in, some interpretation. I think that's like the Ten Commandments would be the close, probably dictation. God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Okay. So is it possible? Well, it meant, and I so think about if the event had to happen, it could have been dictated or it could have been a different interpretation of what happened. How do we know the difference? To her, to her point, yeah, but I, but I think I think a revelation, a, a revelation is more of a vision. So give me some examples of events in the Bible or things in the Bible mm -hmm. that you think were dictated. God spoke, yes. and the person wrote exactly what God said. <coughs> Tell me about it. Yeah. So those those ten, because that's what I mean. That's what the Bible records. Boom. 
But then Moses came down the hill and smashed that and had to get a second set, right? So were those both dictated? Yes. I don't know about and that. And he had a memory. There were only ten. He had a memory. He did. <laughs> but did he interpret? Did he go back up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good, have you read the Bible question? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, he went up and got a second set. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, God, I got angry with the whole golden calf thing. I chucked him. I broke him. Or if you watch Mel Gibson, or Mel, not Mel Gibson, Mel Brooks' History of the World, I bring you these 15 commandments. And <laughs> ten. Ten commandments. Um, so, uh, inspiration. What other versions does it mean to be inspired? Just talk about today. If you describe something as being inspired, what do you mean? You heard a message from God. You heard a message from God. Yeah. You heard his voice. For I also think that like Jesus, he was a teacher, and so I imagine people that heard him speaking or saw him in action were touched in some shape or form, and then they told stories or shared the word to like not only the disciples but also the kids. First-hand accounts, inspired to write the gospel for sure, but um, personal experiences of what? <coughs> Someone had a personal experience and then they wrote it. Yeah. Oh, there could be a fish and that could be a lot of things. Can you give an example, or anybody give an example of a personal experience that was written down that we have in the Bible? Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul to the road to Damascus, yeah. right. Or somebody, the, the folks on the road to Emmaus, too, would be another. Because Jesus didn't write any of the Bible. Right? right? No, we don't have any. Jesus didn't write a gospel about himself. So well, it would be fantastic if he had. He was writing about when they were in the desert. And there's a lot of detail and very specific information about other people and things that happened. So, uh, I'm, can I put that under first hand accounts? Yeah. So, I, I've got dreams. Well, I'll put that up with visions. Um, There's a lot of men also believe in the existence of a dream. How? Now, a lot of those, because you can be awake when you have a dream, and you're asleep when you have a dream. Remember, a lot of, a lot of them have dreams, and then they, like, it came from God, the dream. Is that differentiated in Scripture? I mean, some I don't think we know, like, um, John in Revelation, Paul, at points in his writing, says, I was in the Lord. We don't even, you know, so I, I don't know how to define that. So I don't know if that's a vision or a dream or what, but what it means to be in the Lord. But, um, yeah. I think right. you could be inspired by tradition. And how? How? Okay. We know that Moses didn't write anything, basically, although some would say he did, okay? So it was a verbal, a oral tradition about what happened here and what happened there and this day. And how can yeah, how can it and, and how could an oral tradition be inspired? Because I would agree with that that it can be. It can be, but and this is what we're getting at. I mean this is what we're trying to ask the question. What is it what does it mean that something is inspired? I mean what do we mean when we say that? We mean all these things together, but what are we trying to get at? Because we're talking big picture here, right? <coughs> Inspired means not only you did it mentally, but you did it emotionally too. What do you mean? It's a feeling, it's a feeling as well as a knowledge thing. You believe some uh, judge said over here. You believe it strongly. Yes. That it's that it's in you strongly. somehow. It's all five senses. Because of that, I was going to say about the purposing. What were you going to say? I think of like what purposing, but I think it inspires me to act or behave. Okay. I, mean, I usually think of inspiration as positive inspiration, but I guess it's negatively inspired. But I mean, I, th I usually view that in a positive light towards action or behavior. Or Where does inspiration come from? Uh, yes, when we're talking about scripture, on just a basic level, does, script, does inspiration normally come from within you or from without you? Yeah, some, something outside of yourself touches you in some kind of way and you are inspired. So when we're talking about scripture, the outside thing is God. 
The inside thing would be the people who wrote it down. So how did it get from, I hate that, from God's brain to their hands or whatever? Um, because there's a wide range, there's a, a whole spectrum. On one end, there are people who believe that every word of the Bible, God took their hand and wrote it down. On the other end, it's the same as um, God inspired me to say a certain thing from the pulpit on Sunday, which means God gives me an idea, and then I'm free to shape that idea to this particular church context. That would be on the other thing. Where do we fall on that as a group? What do you think? Another way to put the question is the Bible... Uh, let's see, let me get my eraser out here. I know, it's going <laughs> to... Yeah, quick, somebody blow your nose. We got... We... divine. What is scripture? Where do we want to put it on the spectrum? Human document? Divine document? Wait, wait. You're going to get your say. I'm going to start here. I'm not going to yodel like uh, the Price is Right guy. But, yeah, but eventually he'll whatever it is. But you're going to tell me where to stop. Okay? We're going to start here at the human end. Yeah, and when it gets loud enough, I'll stop. When we hear a, a, a real outcry from the people. Ready? Yeah, and, and you've got to be bold now. You're like, no, 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 there, there. And we'll see. Because if there's only one person saying it, I'm not stopping. Here we go. So we voted, and it's just this side of divine. <laughs> wait, wait, let's keep going. Okay, okay, okay. And now some of us say we can stop. Keep going. Stop. It's official. Maryland is an extremist. About 98. Maryland's going to hit him. She's going to hit him. <laughs> Here's the good news. Oh, oh. Here's the good news. I don't care where you fall on this spectrum. I don't care. But you need to know where you fall because it matters when you open the Bible what you believe about what you're going to read. Because you have assumptions about the Bible, whether you think you do or not. Nobody opens up the Bible and is a clean slate. You have you bring experiences and beliefs and teachings and all this sort of thing, and you got to know what the heck you believe when you open that book up. And so, I mean, it matters. It matters. Let's uh, quickly break down two very fun words: infallible and inerrant. Um, throw your hands in the air. If you would say that the Bible is inerrant. All right. We got saying strong. That's right. Two, three. Okay. Put your hands four. Put your hands in the air if you would say the Bible is infallible. Okay. We have actually a little less than that, but about okay, about the same. A little more. Three, four, five. 
Put your hands in the air if you're not willing to do either one of these because you're afraid that these terms are only applied by fundamentalists. <laughs> okay. We got a little, little more. Yeah! So, I think these two terms are thrown around a lot and people don't know what they mean. But usually, inerrant, and I don't think this is actually true, all the folks that I know that apply the word inerrant tend to be biblical literalists, meaning that they just, you know, their belief is you can open the Bible, read the word there, and what it means to you is what it means, period. I, I don't know if that's everybody's experience, but that's my experience, that that's what they mean by biblical inerrancy, is that it means now what it has always meant or something. And I don't think that's true. I mean, I think the Bible had a meaning to the people it was first written to. If it didn't, God wouldn't have written it to be to those people. But then it continues and endures now and has a meaning to us too that and often is the same, um, sometimes is slightly tweaked. But um, inerrant simply means it's free from error. And I would say that in a lot of ways the Bible is inerrant, meaning error of what kind? I, why does the Bible exist? Does it exist to <coughs> convey truth about... Um, Oh gosh. Throw something out. Wouldn't you think you'd also have to take into consideration what language you're reading it in? Sure. Yeah, we're going to talk about that next. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I think it might be inerrant in spirit, but not inerrant in the technical writings of it. I mean, like I think some of the, the words that he used was about women. And, and the, the, some of the inerrant people would say that. Women should not be leaders in the church. Women should be men, should be pastors. I don't think the spirit of the Bible is an error on that. I think it is, but those words are mistaken. Well, without being a brat to the word, <coughs> I do have to say that I think one of my fundamental issues about inerrance or infallibility stems from the fact that the books. Decision made by its very nature in kind of introducing some degree of bias, some degree of human involvement. The fact that there was a decision made to call some books <coughs> and to include others, uh, <coughs> that to me speaks of some degree of at least lack of objectivity. I was, I was raised with books called Maccabees and Judas, <laughs> you know. The Apocrypha. Right. You know, and um, they're beautiful. There are beautiful things in the apocrypha that human beings decided that were not that those were pure, not pure spirit themselves. So we're going to well, for you also to my two <coughs> statements on that. Be very careful. Uh, most of us talk about the forming of the canonical text with very little knowledge of how it was actually formed. Um, meaning, most of the people that I've talked with about it, they read the Da Vinci Code when it was super. <laughs> when it was super, I'm serious. Yeah. When it was super popular, and they read what Dan Brown said about how the Bible was written, and that's how the Bible was decided, the the canon. And what he wrote is not how it happened. I mean, it, it has some pretty glaring errors to it. So, um, be careful about it. I mean, it, it wasn't this one time where they got together and said, we will include these books and not these, and that's it. Um, it happened over a long time. But, um, yeah, and there are reasons, and we'll get into some of that. We'll get into some of that. We're going to hold inerrant and infallible. I'll just say right now, I'm more comfortable with infallible, simply because inerrant, when you say it, it tends to identify you with certain church groups that I just don't identify with. Or, or, and, and I don't like that, I don't think it's right. I don't think it's right to identify any church group by any one word. But I like the second meaning of infallible, not liable to mislead, deceive, or disappoint. Mm -hmm. Meaning the Bible, the Bible is infallible in being what it is meant to be. I mean, it, but we're gonna end up in this study before we chew on actual books talking about what it was meant to be. And I think it's absolutely infallible, and it, it accomplishes what it was set out to accomplish by God. I think it was miracle. Yes, sir. It's miracle. There are all the fingers that were in that pie. 
And it still came out something they right. put together. Right? It is remarkably, the, the continuity that's there um, is mind blowing given how complex the process was getting it from where it was to, to where it is. So. Go ahead and ask. You, it, I, I might not be able, be able to say it back exactly, but you were saying when you read the Bible, it's an error, an error to you. You can. Do you, do you remember making that? Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Kind of. I don't know. I don't know what I what I actually said, said or what. Read it, it could be an error to you when you read it, and you take away what you interpret, and therefore there's no error. Oh, that's not what I meant by it. No. Um, what I mean is, is it does it contain errors? You have to ask errors of what, um, and I would say for myself, I'm okay with the word inerrant. I use it when I'm thinking through the Bible myself, not when I'm in big groups. I don't normally stand in front of the church and say, I think the Bible is inerrant <laughs> because you don't really have a chance to clarify what that means. What I mean is I don't think the Bible screws up in what it sets out to do. So it didn't, it's not, a, there, aren't, there aren't mistakes in, in what God originally did. And I, and I would almost be so bold as to say, in the original manuscripts, it is the word exactly as God wanted it to be. But here's the problem, which transitions us to the next thing, or the issue, or the fun nuance. We don't have the original manuscripts. So th they don't exist. Whenever they did, we don't have them. So this is the process, and this is where you're free at some point in your own life to, to move along this spectrum. But from God over here to us and how this was made. There were manuscripts. What is a manuscript? It's writing. Yeah, it's just, it's writings of some sort. So the Old Testament was written in what language or languages? Hebrew. Hebrew and Aramaic. Hebrew and Aramaic, most of it in Hebrew. But here's the fun of Hebrew. Here's your, your Hebrew Bible. Um, not only is it fun because it reads right to left, not left to right, which is just a pain when you, <laughs> when you, you try to do it. And I don't remember how to read this anymore. I like even pronounce it because I don't, I just go to people who've already translated it because I don't, I'm not that good at it myself. So. Here is a little bit of Hebrew, though. That oh, didn't work. Um, So there's some, some Hebrew for you. Wonderful, right? This is Biblia Hebraica Stutarkensia. It's the Masoretic text. It's called the Masoretic text because it was put together by the Masoretes. You with me? Yeah, this is life altering, right? You're, you're loving this right now. But it, that's not the original Hebrew text. It's what we use to translate it. In the original Hebrew text, these dots and the, the thing looks like a T in that underneath, those are vowel points. But in the original Hebrew text, there are no vowel points. Did you say vowel points? Vowels. There are no vowels. Not vowel points. So this, um, Yahweh. That's the name of God. Of course, the Hebrew people wouldn't say it. <coughs> but we say, I mean, you've heard Yahweh, right? Or yeah. Yahweh. Um, in English, we do it like so. And I'm capitalizing the words that are actually there. In the Hebrew, we added the A and the E, the vowels. But in Hebrew, it's just this. So Yahweh is a guess. We don't have the vowels. 
the Masoretes supplied the vowels to the text. So we're trusting that the Masoretes got it right. Go home and Google Masoretes. Uh, That's fine. Never well, they do now, yes. Okay. But even uh, a lot, if you go, they don't always though. When you look at um, just pictures from Israel now, not everything is there because it's just assumed. Because it, again, in an oral culture, they said it and they passed these down through the ages. And so the Masoretes wrote and added the vowel signs that they were using. We believe and we trust that those were the ones that were originally there, but we don't know for 100% certain, but it makes sense that it is because the words that we translate from them make sense. Every Hebrew word is based off of three letters, and then they add beginnings and endings to it. This becomes complicated because three letters can be totally different things. Like, um, anybody know what Boker Tov means? Boker Tov! We had to say that in Hebrew to the teacher when she walked in. It means good morning. So, Boker Tov, Baboker Tov means good cow. <laughs> it, I mean, it's, it's that different. You can, just by adding beginnings and endings to words. So, Hebrew is tough. It's also very lyrical. It's very poetic. It's beautiful. If you ever get a chance to go to a synagogue and hear it chanted, gosh, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely <laughs> breathtaking. Greek is not. Greek is wooden. Did anybody take Greek or Latin? Any of those? Yeah, it's, um, it's very mathematical. If you have a mathematical brain, it works. So, or a very linear brain. I loved Greek, absolutely loved Greek, and it was easy because you just learn the endings, you learn your whatevers, and you're good. Hebrew, it's, it's artistic, and so um, that's why in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, there's all sorts of beautiful poetry. The language lends itself to it. Like we said, Genesis 1 and 2 is poetry. Hebrew is gorgeous, and the English doesn't begin to touch it. I mean, there are, and there are even poems like um, <coughs> Psalm 119, that is crazy long, so nobody reads it. Super long. It even looks pretty in Hebrew because it's the, each line starts with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Beit, actually. That's the first two letters. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet. And it goes on through. So the New Testament was written in... Greek! Greek, Greek. 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 Bo Freak, Banana Fana Bo Freak. <laughs> and it's 7.30, all right, that's it. <laughs> um, and we, we, yeah, we'll, we'll end it, but um, it was written in Greek. Greek is linear, it is not so beautiful. We need to go a little longer, six. But what, yeah, we need to just start at 6.30. But what does, but this is key. Be, what Greek was it written in? Was it, anybody ever read the Iliad, the Odyssey, these whatever? Those were written in classical Greek. If you ever learned Greek, biblical Greek, you still will not be able to translate Homer's works. Homer's Greek is complicated, it's precise, and in its own way, it's beautiful. The Bible is written in, the New Testament is written in what is called Koine Greek, which to Homer would have been Greek slang. I mean, it's, it's baby Greek. It's, um, and, and that's not meant to be a, it's, it's common Greek. Koine means common. So it's the Greek of the common people. Um, and it makes sense when you think about who wrote the New Testament, or at least who, who passed it along. These are fishermen, and they're, they're tradesmen. They're not well-educated, many of them. And some of the, and you can tell the books when you translate them. When you read um, Mark, which we're going to study in detail with Genesis, right? And all those <laughs> books. Are really Mark is extremely simple, extremely simple, and it was probably written by a traveling companion to Peter, who was a fisherman, who himself was not well educated. Far more complex. But who was Luke? He was a doctor. Yeah, he was trained. He was educated and traveled with Paul, who was also educated, albeit in Hebrew, but still, um, 
far more educated, more complex Greek. I think that's amazing. So God worked through the simpler folks, the more educated folks, to give us the Bible that we have, which is still read, read by educated folks, uneducated folks, and conveys the truth of God regardless. Next time, bring your Bible, your own personal Bible, and we're going to start by reading the parts of your Bible that you never, ever read. <laughs> because you don't need to, except you do. Because you're making assumptions about your Bible that may or may not be true. And so next week, bring if you have a Bible that you love, that you love to use, a version that's your version, bring it, and we'll figure out where your version came from, and why it is what it is, and what you're reading. Good? Some of you better go home and get a good night's sleep. Because you're yawning. <laughs>